Okay, so welcome back to part two of this week's lecture. I'm just going to briefly recap some of the learning theory justifications for the kind of approaches I've been outlining in the first part of the lecture. I'm not going to go into too much detail because a lot of this you've already covered in the first assignment where you looked at various justifications for active learning strategies. So this clearly resonates with that part of the course. Um, what I am going to say is related to these three themes. So I'm just going to say something briefly about each of these. And the first is about experiential learning. Now, one of the points of a, of a stimulus, or a, sorry, a, um, a simulation, or uh, a role play, or an activity which is collaborative, is that it gives people a concrete experience um, through which they can learn. But it's not synonymous with learning. So how do we move on from the, those those collaborative and social experiences towards learning? Well. The first step is to reflect uh, on that experience, to review it in our minds and in conversation, and then to start to build some kind of abstract conceptualization to draw some conclusions from it. Then we can use those ideas to inform planning for further concrete experience. So at the heart of any talk about uh, learning through doing is this notion that the doing has to be accompanied by a reflective and meaning-making process which leads to the conclusions that can inform subsequent action. So this is at the, at the core, really, of any commitment to experiential learning. Here's another take on that from uh, Peter Jarvis, who focuses that, um, on the role of the person in all of these kinds of experiences. So we take our students, they enter into a situation, our classroom, we give them an experience, um, one of the values of giving them an interesting and engaging experience that really uh, gives them a sustained experience of engaging in historical content and problem solving is that that makes it much more likely they're going to remember stuff. We simply remember things that have an emotional attachment more readily than we do dry lists of content knowledge that we're given in um, list form or reading from a textbook. So one of the values of uh, creating social experiences in the classroom is that they stick more readily in the minds of the students. But then also thinking about this experiential learning cycle, we have to follow up those kinds of experiences with opportunities to reason and reflect and then to evaluate the meaning uh, and identify the learning. That can also feed into memorization and then it can feed into uh, new theories or understandings that we can reapply in similar situations. So not only am I suggesting that role play simulations, games, those kinds of engaging social activities are useful because they're interesting, but also they're useful to keep coming back to and making a recurrent part of your teaching so that children can improve their strategies for engaging in those kinds of learning experiences. They can draw on prior experience, which means you need to give them sequences of relevant and similar experiences. And then at the end of that, they come out as um, either people who have been reinforced in their current uh, levels of understanding or potentially as people who have been changed because they've learned more profoundly through those kinds of experiences in the classroom. Now, there are three dimensions to learning, really, and Jarvis would say that we can conclude that learning involves three different kinds of transformations. Transformation at the personal level, uh, in terms of sensation, the way we sense and engage with the world, and in terms of uh, the social situation itself. And um, Illaris provided this diagram in the middle. He talks about three dimensions to learning being engagement with content and understanding of the content, the incentive dimension, which is the emotional dimension, why we're involved in learning, um, and then the interaction dimension, who we're learning with and how we learn through those interactions with other, with other people. So it just seems to me interesting that we can map these three dimensions against one another. What this means for us in terms of thinking about the history classroom is that when we engage students with the content, we have to recognise that it's transformational to the extent that children are developing and refining frameworks of meaning that give them um, new resources with which to make sense of the world, so new resources with which to interpret history. When we come to think about incentive, we need to provide some um, inherent reason why they will engage with this and invest all of the effort into thinking through um, the kind of history that we're presenting with them with seriously. Um, and the incentive to make meaning, i.e. to go about the learning, is embedded in the desire to solve a problem, says Illaris. 
And one of the values of simulations and role plays and active learning is that we can present people with problems and give them time to struggle through them. So giving someone a problem that is interesting which demands their time and attention to solve is one of the most useful ways to incentivize them towards learning. And then finally, at the level of interaction, the individual makes and verifies answers through interaction with others in various ways. Their answers are constructed from the available cultural resources and interacting with other people simply brings different ways of making meaning and different prior learning to the problem in hand. So these are three um, dimensions to learning, all of which seem to me to be addressed very neatly by focusing on collaborative activities in the classroom. Now, we've already mentioned in relation to incentives uh, something about motivation. I'm just going to say two things briefly, which uh, are, make group work and um, active learning appealing in terms of uh, setting up motivation for students. The first is that if we can draw pupils into activities which they care about, within about which they can become genuinely interested and within which they can invest time and energy over a sustained period of time then we're more likely to stimulate intrinsic motivation without intrinsic motivation we're relying on the teacher's ability to provide carrots and sticks so we might punish people for not working hard enough we might hold out the incentive that they want to do well in school exams or they want to please their teacher and be given praise and rewards all of these things are are essentially manipulating people into doing what we think is good for them. The most powerful learning ultimately derives from intrinsic motivation, which is engaging in learning for the sake of learning, for the joy of learning. Um, and the more we can make this fun and engaging, social and collaborative, the more we're likely to stimulate people to experience learning as intrinsically motivating in its own right. And um, people who've written about collaborative learning appeal to Maslow's hierarchy of needs and they, they point out that it's really important if we want to give people the potential space in which they can um, achieve self-esteem and self-actualization where they can practice these really creative skills it's absolutely essential that we focus on this lower basis that our classrooms create environments where people feel safe and where they feel this sense of security and one of the easiest ways we can do that is provide them with spaces where they can experiment and try out ideas in safety especially if children have um, problems with language or literacy that giving them opportunities to talk to each other to collaborate with others where they won't be immediately judged because everyone is experimenting trying out ideas for size these create the kinds of foundation stones on which people can later be prepared to take bigger intellectual risks. And this also links with learning theory in terms of social constructivism. So um, here's a diagrammatic representation of Vygotsky's zone of proximal development. This is a kind of uh, bedrock of how we think about social constructivism, that if we're teaching a child, we have to think about what's known to the child, we think about what's not known, and in between there is a, a gap which we judge as being the gap where the child can acquire skills which are too difficult to master on their own but with guidance and encouragement from a more knowledgeable person they can start to bridge that gap between what's known and what's not known and obviously the skill of a teacher comes in diagnosing what is known and making a judgment about how far that child could get with encouragement and appropriate support now sometimes the support is directly given by the teacher but other times the teacher almost encodes their support by coming up with clever activities. And if we select resources appropriately, if we design activities to meet the needs of children, and if we set up group work in ways which will help um, children support one another, then we can kind of represent our expertise in those activities. So we can um, set up uh, games and simulations using our own judgment as teachers, as the more knowledgeable other, but leaving children to work collaboratively um, to, to kind of bridge that gap between what's known and what's not yet known. And what's important about thinking about how you move through that zone of proximal development is that it draws on these kinds of processes that essentially you can't make sense of the transition across the zone without thinking about interaction, that if we think about what interaction really means between different people, um, then we're talking about talk, and most interaction is mediated through talk and conversation. 
that the purpose of that talk is about meaning making and searching for patterns and sense within new information that's provided and that essentially comes down to collaborations within the classroom. So the final thing I want to say about this is really just to make the point that talk and collaboration are really at the root of everything I've been uh, promoting in this week's lecture. Most of the activities I've been talking about start by focusing on specific details and then build up to the bigger picture. The strategies for building up to more abstract conceptual thinking revolve around talk and interaction with others in a, in a safe space where groups, uh, group tasks and games provide a sense of fun, provide a sense of security, where children can engage in discussion and experimentation and try to push new ideas out there and look for new connections. If we're promoting experimental talk through these kinds of collaborations, we have to recognise that it's messy. Not all experimental talk leads to profound, brilliant new thoughts. Not all experimental talk leads to the correct conclusions. But giving children the space to try ideas out and to test them against each other is fun and engaging, but it also connects them with higher level thinking and, and is more likely to lead to the development of new and innovative ideas for themselves in terms of how they construct knowledge and how they come and interact with the kind of history skills and ideas that we want them to. And then finally, almost all of these ideas are really structures for encouraging people to talk. Almost all of these games require people to talk them through. Role plays, simulations, board games, all rest, the learning rests on the conversations that happen around these as learning tools. And that talk is our most important um, approach for encouraging children to think. Essentially, talk is the first stage um, of communication through which we can see new thinking being revealed. And so talk is really important. So all of these games are merely just excuses to encourage children to focus productively in different forms of historical talking in the classroom. And the benefit of talk over individual thinking is that you can hear it, you can observe it, and you can engage with it as a, as a more knowledgeable other to help children make the transition from what they know to what they could know with a bit of extra help and support. So ultimately that's the rationale in terms of learning theory, and motivation theory, for why we want to promote games, uh, simulations and collaborative talk-based strategies in the classroom. Here are some of the um, references that I've drawn on in this lecture and um, I leave you to develop some of these ideas and to try some of them out and then to report back some of them in your um, essay two for the course.